Good day. I'm Father John Cusick, uh, chaplain of the First Friday Club, and we welcome all of you today to the first Friday of February, 2021. I say good day because um, we're sort of international. We're just coming up on the, on the noon hour here in the Midwest of the United States, and with us is our speaker, Richard Moore, who was enjoying the afternoon in the north of Ireland on the same day. So good morning would be improper to say to Richard because he's gone through that already. And good afternoon would be improper because we're just beginning it. So I think good day will work well. But thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're very, very excited to have Richard Moore as our, uh, our speaker at the First Friday Club and Maureen Murphy is going to be uh, uh, sort of our leader of this today. And after I say an opening prayer, um, we're going to ask Maureen um, to kick off our meeting, introduce Richard to all of us, and then we'll be um, on our way. So um, this day, beginning the month of February, um, let us take a moment and let us pray. Gracious God, in our country, we are moving into the first couple of weeks of a different government. It's the United States government that has changed its leadership. And we need to pray today for our new leaders, uh, those who have been elected to the highest office of the land, our president and our vice president, and those women and men who have been elected, elected to the Congress of the United States, both in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Besides praying for all of our political leaders, we have to pray today for peace in our country. We have to pray for that commonality called community, where we can put down the angry words, where we can lessen the bitterness, where we all can open up our minds and our hearts to one another. And we cannot be so selfish as to leave out the rest of the world. Help us as a country to be always be compassionate and concerned to the brothers and sisters we have around God's world, particularly to those who are less fortunate um, than we. We take this day, we take this month of February, we take this time in each one of our lives and in the both of the countries from which we come and we put them in God's hands. Amen. Amen. Maureen Murphy on the board of directors of the First Friday Club and she's going to be our facilitator today on this first Friday in February. Maureen, it's all yours. Thank you, Father Cusick. I am absolutely delighted to be here to introduce today's guest. Mr. Richard Moore is joining us from his home in Derry, Northern Ireland. Richard has a compelling story to share with us. It is one of incredible adversity and resilience. Uh, it is one of love and compassion, hope, forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, I, I think that that is all I will say in way of introduction because Richard will do a fabulous job of, of providing us all of the details of his incredible story. And so with no further ado, welcome Richard Moore. Please take it away. <laughs> thank you, morning, And thank you to Father John as well. And uh, Hello to everyone uh, today. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's a real honor for me uh, to, to, to attend the First Friday Club and speak at the First Friday Club. And I want to thank everybody involved in the organization of today's event because I acknowledge that these things don't happen easily. They don't happen without a lot of planning and effort. And I'm extremely grateful. I'm also grateful to my colleague, Ursula Moore, who is uh, off screen. He'll be working my... Uh, shared screen for you. So you'll not see Ursula, but thanks to Ursula anyhow. Um, I'm going to share my personal story with you. And I always say that it is a personal story. So for that reason, you know, what's right for me may not be right for you. And there might be challenging things that I tell or share in my story. And uh, I don't know where all of you are coming from. So I don't know what elements of my story you might find and challenging. But I share my story in the hope that it helps you now or in the future deal with some issues or challenges that you may come across in your life. Um, I, as, as 
Morning pointed out I'm from Derry in Northern Ireland. I've lived in Derry all my life. I'm 59 years of age now. I was born in 1961. And I was born to, in, uh, and grew up in a place called the Craigan Estate in Derry. And if, if you're not familiar with Derry, it's a beautiful city with a river going through the center of the city, uh, dividing the East Bank from the West Bank. And, you know, the city just slopes down towards the river. The Craigan Estate is up on the hill, overlooking the city, and it just slopes down through the bog side, right under the city centre, and past our ancient city walls. And then you have the river. And of course, then you cross the bridge and over to the East Bank. Um, I remember Derry and Northern Ireland before the conflict started. And I lived, the Craigan Estate was an area of social housing. There was about 15,000 people lived there. There was high unemployment a lot of social issues which you would expect with an area like that. But for me, it was a lovely place to live. And I remember doing ordinary things in an ordinary way, kicking football on the street, playing with my friends and all that. And then suddenly, when I was about seven or eight years of age, everything changed. And what seemed like overnight to me, the Craigan, the Bogside, Derry, and Northern Ireland became a war zone. There were shootings, bombings, riots on a daily occurrence. Outside our front door, for example, all the pavements were dug up and broken up and used as missiles to throw at the British Army or the police. They also used the rubble to build barricades at the end of each street. And they hijacked cars, hijacked trucks, buses, set them on fire, put them across the road, and they were cemented in or built into these barricades. All that was done to stop the British Army or the police from infiltrating the Craigan estate easily. So Craigan became officially known as a no-go area. So for a while, the IRA patrolled our streets. I remember watching men with masks and assortments of rifles walking along our street. I remember watching gunmen open fire on the military camps and stuff. I went to, um, well, first of all, I would say that in January 1972, you may recall a very sad but very famous incident in Derry, very well-known incident called Bloody Sunday, where 13 innocent people were shot dead by the British Army in the streets of Derry. Arguably, the weeks and months that followed Bloody Sunday were among the most violent period in the Northern Ireland conflict. At least four or five of those people that were shot dead that day and others who were injured lived within 30 seconds walk from my house. So as you can imagine, the Craigan and the bog site was a very volatile area. I went to the local primary school or elementary school, you would say, in America. And um, the school was positioned on the edge of the no-go area. So right beside the school was a police station. So as you can imagine, a police station on the edge of a no-go area was a target for the IRA. So you had shooting incidents down there and you had bombing incidents down at the police station. So eventually the British Army were brought in to protect the police station. So you had these, what I would describe as semi-permanent military installations set up around the police station. And they were there to protect whatever policemen were in there. Um, one of these army lookout posts, one of these army installations faced into my school playground. On the 4th of May, 1972, just about three months after Bloody Sunday, I got out of school as normal. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon. And me and my friends, went racing along the bottom of the school football pitch, or soccer pitch, you might say in the States. As um, we did so, I had to pass a British Army lookout post on my right-hand side. I was about 10 feet away from it when a British soldier fired a rubber bullet. The rubber bullet hit me here on the bridge of the nose. I lost this eye, 
my right eye and was permanently blinded on my left eye. What I remember that day was running along the, the, the football pitch. And the next thing I remember, I woke up and I was lying on the school refectory table where my music teacher, Mr. Jay Stoherty, he heard the bang, he ran up, he found me lying on the ground, he lifted me and carried me in and put me on the school refectory table. And I remember him saying to me, what's your name, son? And I told him my name was Richard Moore. And he got a bit of a shock because he knew me very well. I was in his music class. But he wasn't, he wasn't able to identify me because of the extent of the injuries. My nose was completely flattened. My eyeballs were out of their sockets and down at my cheekbones. And my face was just a bloody mess. The next thing I remember is I woke up in the ambulance. And at that stage, my daddy and my sister were beside me. I knew I was in an ambulance because I could hear the siren in the background. And uh, I only lived about two minutes walk from the school. So my daddy obviously heard that I had been shot and him and my sister came running down and jumped into the ambulance. I remember my daddy was holding my hand and he kept saying, you'll be all right, Richard, you'll be okay. At one stage, one of the ambulance personnel said to me, Daddy, there's a woman outside. She's very upset. Will we let her in? And my daddy must have looked out the window and he said, no, it's his mother. Don't let her in. And he said that because he didn't want uh, my mommy seeing me in the state that I was in. I went to hospital. I spent two weeks in hospital. For the first week, I was in intensive care, and I don't really remember that much. But about a week after that, after the first week, they moved me out into the general ward in the hospital. I was a football fanatic. I would have kicked a Coke can around the street just to play football. And there was a young boy in the bed opposite me, and I remember joking with him and saying to him, I can't wait to get these bandages off my eyes Did I teach you how to play football. Because I thought it was the bandages that were preventing me from seeing. And that must have been very difficult for my family. I come from a big family. There were 12 children in our house. I was the second youngest. And there was nine boys and three girls. And because of the seriousness of the incident, they all kept a constant vigil around my bed. And for them to hear me talk as if all as I had to do was remove the bandages and everything would be back to normal must have been very difficult. And they must have wondered, how are we going to tell Richard he'll never play football again? How are we going to tell Richard he'll never be able to see again? So it was about a month after I was shot, I was out home. And every day to help build up my strength, somebody would take me for a walk up and down our back garden. This particular day, my brother Noel took me for a walk. And he said to me, Richard, do you know what has happened? And I said, yes, I knew I was shot. And he said, do you know what damage was done? And I said, no. And that's when he told me that I would be blind for the rest of my life. And to be honest, I literally took it to me straight that day until I went to bed that night. And when I was in bed on my own, I cried for the one and only time that I remember about blindness. And I cried because I realized for the first time that I was never going to see my mommy and daddy again. I was never going to see their faces again. And a 10 year old boy, you know, you don't think about the bigger things in life. You don't think about getting a job. You don't think about your education. All as I felt was this enormous sense of loss that I was never going to see my mommy and daddy's faces again. And I cried myself to sleep that night. 
The next day I woke up and got out of bed and began to put the pieces of my life back together. I would always say that day was the first day of the rest of my life as a blind person. I eventually went back to the elementary school I was at. Then I went on to the high school, done all my exams there, went to university, got my degree in 1983, got married in 1984, got divorced in 1985. No, I'm only joking about that. Uh, still married. <laughs> but uh, I have two children, Neve and Enya. Neve is um, 30 years of age now, and or 31 actually, and Enya is 29. Uh, 29 years old, just passed on the 22nd of January. She's 29 years old. And um, I've done a lot of things with my life. I, I was compensated by the British government for being shot. And with half the money, I bought a house. And with the other half, I bought a pub. And if you know anything about the Irish, then a pub's a good business to be in. So two years later, I bought a second pub. And uh, so for 14 years, I ran my own business. I came out of university and had an office above one of the pubs and I ran my business there. I also done a lot of other things. I learned how to play the guitar after I was shot and I played in bands. I, I had a recording studio. I also set up uh, with my wife, uh, the Long Tower Folk Group. And the, the Long Tower is uh, St. Columbus' first monastic settlement in Ireland and Derry here, and that's his church. And 40 years later, I still play the guitar and that folk group and lead that folk group here in the Long Tower Chapel. So if you ever have the chance to be in Derry, come up the Long Tower Chapel, six, six o'clock mass on a Saturday night, and you'll see me strumming away up there. But um, I, uh, I also kept my interest up in football. Uh, in the mid nineties, I became a director of Derry City Football Club. And as all of you know, Derry City Football Club is the biggest club on the planet. I'm sure you all follow Derry City. And uh, in 1997, which was just, uh, I, was, I was a director for about two years at that stage, Derry became the champions of Ireland. It was one of the greatest ex experiences in my life. So, so why am I telling you all that? I'm not doing that to be boastful or to try and impress you. I'm telling you that to acknowledge the things in my life that made it possible for me not only to survive being shot and blinded, but to actually see blindness as a positive experience. And I boil it down to three or four broad things, but I'm going to mention the first three. The first thing is I come from a good family. If it wasn't for my family who caught me, who cushioned the impact of my blindness, and put me back on my feet. So I cannot over exaggerate the importance of my family and my life and my ability to accept blindness. The second thing is I come from a good community. You know, back in the 70s in Ireland, you had no such thing as trauma counselors or therapists. Those words didn't even exist in our vocabulary. The people that supported me and my family was a local community. And the third thing is, despite the poverty, despite the conflict going on on our streets, I was still able to go back to school and get an education for myself. So I had, even as a blind person, I had opportunities. And I suppose it's that fact that prompted me to start the organization Children in Crossfire. You know, when I, in my young adult years, I became very aware of children in other parts of the world that suffered from the injustice of poverty. Children that woke up every day, not knowing where their next meal was going to come from, where their next drink of water was going to come from. People that had, didn't even have a home life. And, you know, at times I felt I'd rather be blind and live in Northern Ireland than to have my eyesight and have to endure the suffering that children have to endure in other parts of the world. Uh, so I eventually sold out the business and I set up an organization called Children in Crossfire. I started Children in Crossfire in 1996. So that's 25 years ago now. We're celebrating our, 20, our 25th anniversary this year. And over those years, 
we have supported projects in Africa, Asia, and South America. Today, children in Crossfire work in Tanzania and Ethiopia. And we work with some of the most vulnerable children on the planet. Um, some of the photographs that you're seeing now are photographs that were taken in the areas and the communities that we support. You know, our main entry point into the villages where we operate is providing access to preschool education. All of you, I'm sure, know how important it is for your children or for our children to be able to go to school at an, er an, er an early age, three or four years of age, or even younger. That stimulation is so important in a child's life. Many children in, in Africa don't start school that are nine or 10 years of age. By that stage, it's too late. Their brains have already developed and they are already at a serious disadvantage. So therefore, it's no surprise that many of the children spend a year or two at primary school or elementary school and then drop out. So Children in Crossfire has embarked on a program to try to make sure that every child in Tanzania and Ethiopia have access to a preschool education. So we train teachers, we provide classroom resources, we build classrooms because many of these children sit in classrooms that are nothing more than just a derelict building. Many children sit underneath a tree in a field and are educated. But as well as that, you know, it's one thing getting a child into the cl classroom and having teachers and resources. But if a child is hungry or suffering from waterborne diseases like diarrhea, then that child's not going to learn, are they? So Children in Crossfire also tackle some of the issues that impact on children by providing nutrition programs and water programs. I would encourage you to look at the Children in Crossfire website which is childrenincrossfire.org to see the work we do. But for me, poverty is not an issue of charity. It's an issue of justice. These children and their parents are only asking for the same basic human rights that you and me would expect for our children. So when you support an organization like Children in Crossfire, you're helping us restore the rights of those children. You're helping us protect some of the most vulnerable children on our planet today. Now, I'm not the only one that suffered as a result of my blindness. My mommy and my daddy suffered enormously. You know, I mentioned Bloody Sunday earlier on. My mommy's brother, my uncle Jared, was shot dead on Bloody Sunday. And less than three months later, I was blinded, all by the British Army. My parents were two very devout Catholics. They went to Mass every single day of their lives. You would never have seen my mother without her prayer book. They didn't support violence in any way. But despite their best efforts to avoid the troubles, the troubles found us. And their world was turned upside down over the space of a few months. And I can remember just after I got out of hospital, lying in my bed at night, and my mommy would come up and she thought I was sleeping. And she would leave beside my bed and start to say her prayers. And then she would break down and start to cry. And the crying would get out of control. And she'd be saying things like, look at him, God. He's only a 10-year-old boy. Please give him back his eyesight. Please give him back his eyesight. And she wouldn't be doing it in the cool, calm way that I'm doing it now. She was desperate. And then... I would pretend to wake up and she'd kind of pull herself together. For me daddy, the day that they told him in the hospital that I would be blind for life, he came back 
and stood in the middle of our street and cried with the men out of our street. And you know, in 2005, I started to write my autobiography. And I called my autobiography, Can I Give Him My Eyes? And the reason why I did that is because when the doctors told me, Daddy, that I was going to be blind for the rest of my life, my daddy was an unemployed shoemaker. He had no money. He had nothing to offer, only his own eyes. And he, he, said, he said to the doctor, can I give him my eyes? And I did discover that the 30 odd years after the incident. So I thought it was the most caring and loving thing to do. So I wanted to kind of immortalize that. And that's why I called my book, Can I Give My Eyes? For me, I am a very happy and contented blind person. I told you that already. But I wouldn't be telling you the truth if I didn't admit to you that there are times in my life when I must may I say it. Of course there is. For example, when my two daughters were born, Neve and Enya, I was there in the ward when they came into the ward for the first time. And I couldn't see them. When they opened their eyes for the first time, or when they smiled for the first time, I couldn't see them. And I remember when they made their first communions and their confirmations. And all of you know, if you're Catholic, how important that is in the family and how important it is in a child's life. So they're all dressed up in like a mini wedding and they're walking up the aisle in their beautiful dresses. I sat in the Craig in the chapel and I couldn't see them. You're able to do something now that I will never be able to do. You're able to look at my children. You know what my children look like. I will never be able to do that. That's the consequence of violence. That's the consequence of war. And you've got to ask yourself, is it worth it? Well, it wasn't worth it for me. But despite all of that, I told you there were four things that helped me cope with blindness. Despite all of that, I never had a moment's anger or a moment's hatred. And I remember a many occasion thinking about the British soldier that shot me and asking, you know, does he ever think about me? Does he ever think about what he did that day and what it's meant for me for the rest of my life? But as I say, despite all of it, I never had a moment's anger or a moment's hatred. And when you think about anger and hatred, it's a self-destruct emotion. It destroys you from the inside out. If I had been angry with a soldier, he wouldn't have known about it. It wouldn't have made one difference to him. So for me, anger is like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. So I'm glad I didn't have that to the point where I wanted to meet the soldier that shot me. Um, for 33 years, I didn't know who he was at all. I knew nothing about him. And then in 2005, I found, I found out his name for the first time. And his name's Charles. And in January, 2000, in January 2006, I flew to Scotland on my own and met Charles for the first time. And they sit in a hotel foyer opposite the man that blinded me for life. And to like him was an incredible experience. 
And me and Charles talked for four hours and three quarters that day. And I learned two things about forgiveness. The first thing is forgiveness is first and foremost a gift that you give to yourself. And what I mean by that, forget about Charles. If he wants my forgiveness, he has it. But what's important for me and my heart and my mind is I forgive him for my peace, for my contentment. So forgiveness is first and foremost a gift that you give to yourself. The second thing about forgiveness is it doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. And again, what I mean by that is the fact that I forgive Charles isn't going to give me back my eyesight, is it? It isn't going to take away all those hurts that were caused to me and my family all those years ago. But what it did do and has done has changed my future. And I genuinely believe that I would not be the person I am speaking to you today, having done all the wonderful things that I've enjoyed so much through my life, if I had been wracked with anger, bitterness, and hatred. And I would ask you a question. What would you rather see today? Would you rather see an angry Richard Murr that's saying, I hate the British soldier, I hate the army, and let's lock him up and throw away the key? Or would you rather hear the story that you've heard from me today? Because there's nothing special about me, and there isn't. I agree and accept that my life's journey has been different. But I was just an ordinary wee boy running around the Craig and Estate in Derry doing all the things that an average young boy would do. So if I can do it, you can do it. And I always say, you know, you can take away somebody's eyesight, but you can't take away their vision. And my vision is the work that I'm doing with children in Crossfire. I want to thank you. I want to thank the committee and for, for listening to me today. Thank you, Richard. Um, I have to admit um, that I'm not feeling very professional in this moment. I, <laughs> I have found your story so, so moving, so compelling and truly so inspiring. Um, thank you um, for sharing it with us. And, and, um, and if you don't mind, I would like to take just a moment um, before we begin our conversation and I ask you some questions, Richard. I'd like to take this moment just to remind everyone um, that you're watching and listening to a very special presentation of the First Friday Club of Chicago. Joining us today is Richard Moore, who is the founder and CEO of Children in Crossfire. We thank you uh, for joining us and we urge you to contribute to First Friday Club so that we can continue to provide free programming through the pandemic. Uh, please consider going to the First Friday website and making a donation to support our programming. So back to you, Richard. Um, gosh, where to begin? I, I, I must say that I am in awe of the strength of your parents. And while you uh, yourself were quite, uh, I, I think you call yourself ordinary, but I think you were quite a remarkable young child to manage that incredible trauma as you did. Um, and I, I, I think about what you told us about your parents and your family. Um, gosh, your parents, what remarkable people. Uh, do you want to add anything um, to the story of who they were? Yeah, well, my mommy and daddy were two people from, from Derry here. And, uh, you know, um, my mommy kind of lived from a, a wealthier side of town back in those days. You know, my mommy was born in 1919 and uh, 
and my daddy, he he was kind of born very close to the city centre, and uh, I, I suppose his parents passed away when he was seventeen years of age, and you know, he, so he pretty much had a fan for himself. But uh, you know, um, despite everything, you know, as a family, we were rich in love and compassion. And, you know, when I talk about children in Crossfire and the work we have achieved or the work we're doing in Tanzania and Ethiopia over the last 25 years, you know, if there are children alive today there, if there's children receiving access to education, it's not because of me. It's not because of children in Crossfire. It's because of people like my parents who showed me what real love and compassion is about. And I only ever wanted to pass on some of what I received. And that is the gospel truth. That's all I ever wanted to do. And so I attribute anything that's been achieved to those people like my parents and other people in my life. It showed me real love and compassion and taught me that every child given the right opportunity in life, no matter how difficult the circumstances, can grow and blossom and contribute in a positive way to the lives, their own life and the lives of others. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I believe that, that all of your words are true. Um, can you tell us Richard, how is it that Children in Crossfire chose to work with the children, the communities in Tanzania and Ethiopia? Yeah, well, basically, when I started Children in Crossfire back in 96, I didn't know very much about international development work, really. I had a real passion to do something and try to make a difference in the world. And, um, you know, I, I just, you know, uh, started with all that gusto and desire to help and raise money but like everything you know you, you you have to set up a charity properly and we set up a board of directors and stuff and uh people on that board um had international development experience and some of them even worked in developing countries and they had direct contacts in tanzania and ethiopia reliable direct contacts of people that you know that were doing good work and that's how we initially started so we were raising small amounts of money in the early days and we were sort of delivering that you know through those partner organizations many of whom we're still working with uh, so that's that's how it was more it wasn't very strategic in those days it was just down to the people on our board had good reliable connections that we could work through makes sense yeah. uh, so May I ask, um, so you are in these two countries, um, are you able to work with local organizations yes. there in Tanzania and Ethiopia? Yeah, please tell us. Yeah, our philosophy, one of our sort of um, values is working in partnership, you know, and uh, that's been a very important aspect of our work. You know, part of development is not just sort of providing the food on the table or training teachers and that, you know, or building classrooms. Development is about empowering people too and about giving people control and decision over their own lives and their own environment. And, um, you know, there are many, many good organizations working in developing countries that have evolved there, who are from there, run by people who live there. And it's very important that we help build that capacity. And you know, that's been, that's been particularly significant over the last year, you know, with the whole COVID and coronavirus impact, because many organizations can't travel to the locations where they have projects. They can't go in and deliver what they're doing because they don't have a capacity there. Whereas when you work through local organizations, then that capacity still continues. And we discover that through our work that uh, that whole localization approach, partnership approach, actually was, was one of our biggest strengths and has been acknowledged now in the international development world as 
possibly one of the ways to go forward. Um, so I, we do work in partnership in Tanzania. We have three different organizations that we work in partnership with. And in Ethiopia, we have one, two, three, also three organizations, the Addis Catholic Secretariat and Addis Ababa is who we work with. St. Luke's Hospital is one of our partners down in Wallisso and a group called MEDAT who provide early childhood education. And in Tanzania, we have three other organizations as well. So, um, you know, and, and that's very important to us. It makes such great sense. And then are you also able to employ local community members? Yes, we in Tanzania, we, we, we have 13 staff. Only one of those staff is an expat. All the rest of the staff are from Tanzania. That is great, that is great. Um, and, and can you tell us uh, some of the stories of the people you've served and, 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 and maybe some of their successes? Richard? Yeah, well, I'll give you one good example. I would have went under it earlier, only I, I was always conscious of time, you know, but um, in, in uh, and a Versa who's on the sidelines happens to have the photographs, you can throw it up, but no problem if she doesn't. Um, I went to Ethiopia back in uh, 2008. And um, when I arrived at the airport, the people that met me there, Anata Sababa, took me to a graveyard. And it wasn't they meet people who were dead. It was the it wasn't they visit people who were dead. It was they visit people who were barely alive in a graveyard. There was two hundred and sixty people living and sleeping on top of graves. Some of them were adults now, but they went into that graveyard when they were younger children, and they now had families. They were living in makeshift houses built on top of the graves, like made out of plastic bags, made out of bits of wood, bamboo, whatever they could find. They built these houses on top of the graves and they lived and slept there. They had no running water, no electricity, no sanitation. The day that I went, there was a torrential rainstorm and I was standing literally up to my ankles in mud. That's what they slept in. That's what they lived in. It was a horrific situation. And one of the people, the spokesperson there that day, they were all sitting on the ground waiting for me to arrive. They heard that somebody was arriving that could help them. And the spokesperson said, look, if somebody doesn't come soon, we're all going to die. Um, Children in Crossfire got involved immediately, more or less. And we began to provide, uh, put in place a feeding program. We also bought blankets and better utensils so they could live at least be a bit warmer and drier in the graveyard. And we also bought cooking utensils. We employed a, a nurse to visit the graveyard every week. And we employed a teacher to start a class up underneath a tree there. But, you know, um, eventually we moved all 260 people, two years later, we moved them. We bought 60 small condos and moved all 260 people, 60 families out of the graveyard and into these condos. But I should say, when I first visited, I met a young girl called Tanaya. And Tanaya was 11 or 12 years of age. And the reason why she stood out in my mind was because I had a daughter the same age back in Derry. And I couldn't help comparing the life that she had in Derry compared to Tanaya. You know, my daughter was probably back home on the phone, you know, in a lovely, warm, comfortable home, well-fed, planning where to go that weekend or with her friends. Tanaya, her father had died from malaria and her mother was down washing the clothes at a river near the graveyard and she got swept away by a freak wave. Tanaya was what they call in Africa, a child head of household. She was the oldest, so she was in charge of four other siblings. One was three years of age, one was five years of age, eight years of age, and I think 10 years of age. And then there was Tanaya. So I always kept Tanaya in my mind when I was trying to motivate myself. And you know, I went back, I, I go back there regular, but I went back around 2000 and 
um, maybe, well, let's say three years ago or four years ago, I went back. And I met Tanaya. And Tanaya invited me up to her small condo. And I went up and I sat down in an armchair. And she planked and placed a little baby in my arms called Barkat. And Barkat was her baby. Tanaya was now a mommy. And um, I couldn't help thinking that um, that was a life that never would have happened if it wasn't for the people that support children in Crossfire. And in that graveyard now, or in that sort of that housing development now, 16 of those young people are at third level education. The parents are in employment. They set up their own businesses, candle making and the soap making, and they're selling that in the market. At the moment, they're experiencing a bit of difficulty because the markets are closed. So we, we have now introduced another feeding program just to get them over this stage. And, um, it's, and, and very shortly, um, the church where we bought the condos through will be handing the houses over, the deeds of the houses over to the families. And uh, to me, that is just one of the most remarkable programs that I personally was involved in. That is an amazing story. I am in awe of uh, the work that you have made happen through uh, Children in Crossfire, Richard. Truly amazing. Um, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time together. So um, before I ask uh, the last couple of questions, I, I just wanna remind people again um, that we are here today with Richard Moore, the CEO and founder of Children in Crossfire and uh, know that your contributions to the First Friday Club uh, have made this presentation and so many others through this time of pandemic possible. Uh, feel free to go to the First Friday website and uh, make a donation if you so wish. Uh, back to you, um, Richard. Um, I, I, I am really uh, struggling here for, for questions. When you tell such a compelling human story of the success of your work, it almost makes the, the question about metrics, um, you know, sort of far too dry given the, the humanity behind the stories you're telling. But, but I am curious, um, I'm sure that you measure the, sec the success of the programming and, and use that, uh, those metrics to decide how you'll continue and, and perhaps expand and evolve the work that you're doing. Can you elaborate a little bit for us about those plans, those metrics, please? Yeah, well, I think every organization, um, you know, and, and especially in today's world, first of all, you have to know the problem you're trying to solve. You have to know the extent of the problem you're trying to solve. And to do that, you have to, I suppose, embark on your baseline sort of information and, and try, to, try to grab that really and find out, you know, the challenges that are, you know, for example, this, uh, in our case, the state of preschool education in the villages where we operate? Are, are, there, are there preschool education happening? Are there children attending preschool? If not, why not? What are the issues that are impacting? And nine out of 10 times in our experience, it's been the lack of trained teachers, the lack of resources, the lack of classrooms. So when you establish all that and you establish the data around that, then, and that's only one example, our team in Tanzania are much more in depth than that, but you get that baseline to work from. And then you deliver the project. And you know, projects are not instant success. They take time. And it's important that throughout the duration of a program, then you assess where you're at and, 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 and try to assess, are you having an impact on, on that data, uh, a positive impact? And if not, again, why not? And, and try to see what's working. And based on that, then you move forward. And there's been, you know, quite a few sort of analysis of children in crossfires work um, 
by our funders, by other organizations who are not funding us, and of course ourselves. And every year we monitor and evaluate our, our programs. And that's, that's extremely important in today's world, uh, really, that you, you're, you're able to do that. Um, and it, it's good that you do that because you, you want to know that you're having an impact. You want to know that you're, that you're you know, that you're um, improving a situation realistically. Um, there's the elements of your work that it's always hard to fully assess, you know. It, it, it's like me talking to you today. How do you know this is making a difference? How do I know that the people out there are, are going to take my story or the, the things within it and, 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 and do anything with it? But, uh, you, so there's that element that you would say that, mm -hmm. you know, that you plant a seed or you, you create mm -hmm. something and maybe it's going to be a long time before um, you you know how you, it's having an, 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 an impact. But generally we have to do that and we do that on a regular basis. You know, like for example, at the moment in the Dodoma area of, of um, Tanzania, we have, you know, we're, we're training teachers spread over 700 schools, you know, uh, in, in preschool education. And at the end of the program, we will be assessing how, how that's been taken forward. And we're doing it in tandem with the Tanzanian government as well, because it's very important, no matter what you do, and the, and, and, well, where possible, that you get the, the government to engage, because ultimately, children in Crossfire is not responsible for education in Tanzania. The government are. And it's important that the government are on board. And I'm glad to say that we are part of a government steering committee. In fact, we're leading a government steering committee in Tanzania around the whole area of early childhood education. So, you know, when we roll out that programme, and we are rolling out that programme now in, in, in the DOMA, then that programme will be assessed constantly over the next three years. It's a three-year programme to see that they the assess the impact of it. And then, you know, after that, then the resources may not be available for us to continue to assess it beyond that point. But you know, I would love something like that, but it may not be available. But we could certainly assess it over the next three years. And that's very important in, in, in any international NGO's work. I think it's important in all our work, isn't it? It is indeed. It, it, it is indeed. And um, as we're nearing the end of our time, um, Richard, um, I think just to put a punctuation um, mark on uh, all that you've said, um, reading your book, um, and I, I forgive me for not noting the page, uh, uh, but <laughs> you did say uh, there is sight and there is vision. And your vision, um, those 25 years ago, um, you know, those 40 some years ago and today is, is really quite remarkable. Um, wow, you, you and uh, uh, you personally and professionally are making uh, quite a difference in the world. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, and I, I guess I ask, um, is there any last thing um, you'd like to say? Although I, I am just, I'm, I'm interrupting myself to say um, to everyone who might be interested, you may want to pick up a copy of Richard's book and, and you can do so by going to uh, the Children in Crossfire website. And the title, as Richard told us earlier today, is uh, Can I Give Him My Eyes? Uh, as his father um, queried uh, the doctors in Derry at the time of, of, of the shooting of of, of our guest, Richard Moore. So in any event, pick up the book if you uh, want to hear ever more about this remarkable man and his story. Um, before we say goodbye, any last words for us, Richard? Uh, well, I would just, you know, um, say to anyone listening, look, you know, um, the worst thing in the world to do is do nothing. And I think whatever small, you know, the first donation, for example, to Children in Crossfire, the very first donation was from a little woman here where our, the Children in Crossfire office is positioned in the long-term parish in Derry. It was a, a, a widow woman gave us a hundred pounds. That's a lot of money for a widow woman to give uh, 
in Derry back in 96. And I've never lost sight of that. I've never lost sight that people constantly give more than they can afford quite often to children in Crossfire. And, you know, as I say, the worst thing to do is do nothing. Well, you are challenging us today. And um, before we close out and, and turn this back over to our dear father Cusick, I, I wanna read the poem um, that you've included on um, the, the page of your foreword in your book, um, Richard. And, and if I might, as Richard has written in his book, can you say at close of day before you meet the night of all the troubles in the world, you helped to put one right? I would say, Richard, that you have done so much more than put one right. Uh, we are grateful uh, to you for all that you do and continue to do. And we're certainly grateful that you were willing to share your time with us today. On behalf of all of us, we thank you. We wish you all good things. And with that, I, I turn it over to Father Cusick to close us out today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard, thank you. I, I've, been, I've been sitting here um, pondering. I think that's the best word I can come up with. Um, your journey and the things you do with life. And when I ponder, I begin to think an awful lot about life itself. Um, what are we all called to do? What's our place? How do we make it better? <clears throat> I've been a preacher for 55 years and I'm always preaching how we can, we're called to build a better world. Um, and if everybody did something. Um, but one of the insights you gave me today is there's a difference between sight and vision. Most of us, by the grace of God at this moment in time, have our physical sight. But you, by the grace of God, have been given vision. You were able to see things beyond yourself, beyond the predicament that violence brought into your life, uh, to be able to take your two pubs, put them up for sale, build a better world, give people in some of the most devastating parts of our world your vision for what life can be. And so now I have to ask myself today, yeah, I can see, but what is my vision for the world? What is my vision that Richard Moore has passed on to me today from his vision for life. So I'm grateful to you, sir. And when the pandemic eases and you get a chance to be in Chicago physically, uh, we will meet, trust me. And we will uh, shake hands. And I believe we might be able to have a Guinness together. Um, <laughs> because that's the most beloved way uh, to share a common heritage. So thank you. Uh, you've given me sight to see, a vision to behold, and a world to make better. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, thank you very much. May God continue to bless you. And Maureen, thank you so much. And folks, in ending today, it's always our job to uh, present our next speaker and We've got a Chicago kid who made good. Uh, our speaker at the beginning of March, the first Friday of March, is Cardinal Wilton Gregory, who was elevated to the, Car the College of Cardinals um, a month or so ago by Pope Francis. Uh, Cardinal Gregory was um, a kid at St. Carthage grade school at 73rd and Yale on the south side of Chicago when he wasn't even Catholic. And in fifth grade, he went to, which turned out to be a mutual friend of the Cardinals and myself, Father Jerry Weber, and said, I think I want to be a priest. And Weber, Father Weber said to him, but you're not even Catholic. 
And the now Cardinal Gregory said, well, what do I have to do? And the rest is history. So we've invited Cardinal Gregory to be with us next month. And I'm hoping that he will take us on a bit of a journey from being a grade school kid in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago uh, to one of the most private and special and sacred clubs in the world, the College of Cardinals. Um, a man from Chicago who is doing very, very good things with our lives. And I think like Richard, he has a vision for what life can be and what our church can be to help others. So we look forward to being with you on the first Friday of March. I think that's March 5th. And uh, Richard, we thank you today for being with us on this first Friday of February. And we pray that until all of us meet again virtually at the First Friday Club of Chicago, we have a peaceful month and let's pray for our country. Let's pray for the North of Ireland. Let's pray for Tanzania. Let's pray for the people of Ethiopia, all God's children. God bless. Have a good month. See you then. Thank you.